Okay, so we are back to the cracks in postmodernity with Eric Serrano, not to be confused with Eric, who doesn't exist. Um, so he's a Jesuit seminarian who's studying at the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley. Very happy to have our first Jesuit on the podcast. So welcome. I hope, I hope I'm not the last Jesuit either. Well, you never know. Um, with you guys, but no, this is a historic event to have someone of the society. So today we're gonna to talk about a couple of things. We're gonna talk about Pope Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger, paparazzi, and his postmodern sensibility, talk about some of the mystical saints, talk about Nietzsche and postmodernism. A lot of things that um, definitely wanna hear hot takes from a Jesuit about, so. Here we go. So we're going to start with the introduction to Christianity, which is, I would say, one of my favorite Benedict Ratzinger books. Um, would you agree, or do you have another favorite? No, I think this one has a lot of staying power with me. One of the first books I read by him, and I, I always go back to it at least, you know, once a year, several times a year, because it, it's so good, especially in the beginning, where he's laying down the foundations of what does it mean to be doing theology in, in the modern age. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say has been most striking or most helpful to you as you've read it? As I've read it, I think just, um, well, all the images he gives in the very beginning before he gets into the, the creed, because he uses the creed in, throughout the book to really talk about what does it mean to be a Christian in today's world. But as he's getting it set up, he gives the story about the, the clown in the burning town. Mm -hmm. That's a story that, you know, Kierkegaard alludes to. And, um, but essentially as the circus is coming to town, it catches on fire and um, threatens to burn down this town that they're gonna perform in. And so the clown, he runs to the town to warn the villagers that there's a fire coming, there's a fire coming. Mm -hmm. But he's in his clown makeup, clown clown costume and everyone sees it and I, they think it's a joke and they just laugh at him on point. But then the, the fire comes and burns down the whole town. And so uh, Ratzinger is kind of comparing the you know, position of, of a theologian today of, you know, they seem like clowns to, especially the uh, modern society. And so his question is, is it just so easy to, you know, take the makeup off, off one's face and be able to speak clearly to really interact with the modern world? And um, he, he wants to go a little, he wants to go beyond that, especially with, because um, I mean, centuries prior, um, 19th century, going into the 20th century theology, like a lot, of, a lot of the theology discussion is going on in Germany and it's the historical critical method has become the way of doing, looking at scripture and um, making theological claims. And uh, so he's really um, responding to that. And he, he mentions, you know, a lot of, you know, German scripture exegetes, but, you know, claiming of like, that's not enough in order to doing like a correlation of um, bringing up to date how we read these texts doing the historical critical method and then trying to bring it to make sense to today's uh, experience. Ratzinger, I think he wants to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good way to characterize his method that he wants to go beyond the conventions in theology in the culture and really go to the, the depth. And this is where I think there is a kind of postmodern sensibility because you want to really dig under these conventions and look at, okay, what's really happening here? Um, and I think that's the great thing about him using Kierkegaard's story of the clown, because I just know for me growing up, you know, like having a belief in some kind of deity, but not like, I don't know, like when I would hear maybe fundamentalist or charismatic preachers talking about like, oh, we need salvation. We need, you know, Jesus to save us from our sins. Like, I always kind of laugh because I was like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah, God's there and that's nice. But like, what do you mean we need salvation? Like, it's it falls upon deaf ears in this culture because I'm sure we're conscious of our, our faults and our mistakes, but to understand sin, original sin is this condition that we can't save ourselves from. Like, that is in, um, it's a, a message that's really hard to receive. So like, either we keep playing this clown act that people will laugh at, we could take off the clown outfit and try to um, speak the language of the culture. And yet there's, there's something beyond both of these options that I think he's trying to make us look at. And he starts by asking, okay, but what do we really believe? And that's why in the book, he's going through the creed and really examining like, what does Christianity actually say 
before we either keep harping on this message or water it down. What is it in the first place? That's what I think is most fascinating here. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think most fascinating too is, um, well, just the way he speaks and he, he does this constantly throughout, you know, his, his time in academia, well, academia and then as archbishop and then in the CDF and then as Pope, you know, as, of course, as um, he doesn't rely on kind of the neo-Thomist arguments. Of course, that really changed leading up to Vatican II because everyone was tired of the manualist tradition, which was the tradition of um, going back to strictly certain interpretations of Thomas Aquinas uh, leading up to Vatican II. So, you know, people, he, Ratzinger was part of the movement. He, he was at Vatican II. He was, um, and he helped draft some of the documents, but him, Karl Rahner, um, Yves Kangar, you know, Henry de Lubac and, and others, they were trying to do something new. And, and you see this, especially with, because they go back to the re return to the sources, resourcement was a big thing leading into Vatican II. What does that mean? They looked at the early church. How did the early church understand themselves? How did they understand scripture? How do they understand the early apostolic witnesses? And um, that really invigorates a lot of what we see leading into the Council of Vatican II. And because um, the church, again, was really under attack in the 19th century with nerdity and liberalism and democracy and all these things. And it became a, a sealed entity. And, you know, neo-Thomism became something. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of respect for, for Thomas, but there, there are certain strands of neo-Thomism that became very calcified within the church and almost, you know, was not helpful, uh, especially going into the 20th century. But so he's, he's part of that whole uh, new way of looking at things, especially returning back to how the ch early church understood itself. And so he's very uh, Augustinian in that sense. And he also has a lot of influence by uh, Bonaventure from, you know, the Middle Ages as well. And um, he, 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 in his other book, um, Values in a Time of Upheaval, he says, he says it outright. He says, you know, we, we use the natural law to talk to the secular world because it's using human reason to make these arguments. But he, he says it upright. He's like, that has become a blunt instrument. So I'm not going to rely on that to make these different arguments. And so he's, he's always looking for new ways to, to talk to the culture. Yeah, and I, I mean, that definitely resonates with me because natural law, sure, we all have access to it. But I do think the direction of our culture is kind of numbing us to being able to receive it or recognize this law written into our hearts. And I think the only, the most powerful way, rather, to appeal to people today is through this kind of Augustinian been having to do with desire, having to do with experience. Because even if you reject all the rational arguments of natural law, there's something that's undeniable about this experience of the abyss, of being suspended over a void, which he talks about. He references, um, who is it? I think it's Claudel's story about, is it Claudel? It's Claudel. I think that's so, the yeah. Jesuit who's in the water and he's that's hanging onto the, the wood. And then there's the atheist. Basically saying that both the believer and the non-believer are in the same position. Like we're living in this modern world where this promise of meaning isn't so concrete anymore. That doesn't mean it's totally unavailable or that it's gone, but it does mean that there, it's, it's a risk. It's, um, you know, it's not totally obvious anymore and we can't be naive and pretend that it still is. And he mentions a couple paragraphs later, St. Therese who like grew up in this Catholic bubble, perfect Catholic family, but even she, as she was facing her own death, like, felt herself suspended over the abyss of unbelief. And I think, again, like Thomism, metaphysical realism, scholasticism, all these things are very useful if you do want to understand the logic behind certain teachings. It's very important, but as an entryway into the most essential parts of faith, I think it's, it's lost its power. So like to go back to the beginning, go back to the fathers, go back to Augustine, who talks about the restlessness of the heart, the abyss of being stuck in your sin, that's so real still for people today yeah I, I i totally agree with that um especially with yeah i mean i feel, I feel like you really hit on anselm's quote of faith seeking understanding mm -hmm. and um if you want to if you want to talk to someone about faith you don't bombard them with uh you know metaphysical arguments about you know causality and cause and effect and those kinds of things but like you, you really hit them where in their desires especially you know Augustine, he's all about desire, especially in the confessions. And um, our hearts are really restless. And I feel like that's, that's a question, especially, especially now, you know, because 
again, I was what Rad saying, or what I, what I really appreciate in the early section of uh, introduction to Christianity as well is talking about knowledge and truth, and really looking at how modernity has really, you know, changed the concept of what knowledge and truth is. Because, um, well, and he talks about in the Reagan, Reagansburg, Reagansburg's address as well, you know, looking at Descartes as uh, knowledge is, um, what am I trying to say? The, well, there's a subjective turn. So knowledge is, we can only count on ourselves. So there's a, you know, there's some autonomy there too, but knowledge is what we make and what we create as well. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important to look at like, he's tapping into a broader theme within Christian spirituality that extends beyond the church fathers. And, you know, we've been talking about some of the Carmelite mystics, some of the, you know, the saints who really delve deep into their experience of suffering and allow themselves to feel that desolation, to feel that emptiness and not just cover over it with these kind of, um, again, these naive presuppositions about, oh, well, Jesus is going to save me. God's going to make everything better. Like, no, sometimes life sucks and is really dark and we need to look at it for what it is and say, okay, if there's a God, do you enter into this abyss? Not like, do you magically take me out, but are you present even here? Um, so right. and, yeah, so like for me, I think of John of the Cross who, uh, I mean, he went through an intense suffering at the hands of his own confreres. The Carmelites didn't like what he and Teresa of Avila were doing. So imprisoned him, beat him, kind of starved him. But it was in that dark night, in that abyss, that this mystical kind of spousal imagery between, you know, Christ and the church, Christ and the individual person emerged. Um, so you see that like, in no way was he trying to avoid his suffering. It was through going deeper into the suffering, into the darkness, he recognizes like how alluring Christ's love is. And it becomes even more concrete because he doesn't avoid what he's, uh, he doesn't avoid the, tr the reality of what's happening. Like this is really dark and it sucks. And it feels like you're abandoned, but you know, are you here? Where are you? You know. Oh yeah, totally. And I, I think that sentiments of like, oh, salvation, can I be saved? I do think that that's a very modern thing too. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, when we strip away a lot of the tradition, like we're left with something that's kind of flaky and is very brittle, you know? But um, yeah, John of the Cross, I mean, when he was imprisoned, I think that's where a lot of his writings, especially Dark Knight of the Soul, really came through. And I, it's a question I've always thought about too, is like, how does one suffer? So I think that reveals a lot of who you are as a person, where you are spiritually, um, you know, maturity wise, psychologically, and you know, whatever else, but how do you suffer? And from him, it came this beautiful, beautiful gift for, for the rest of us, you know, of what does it mean to enter in the dark night? Where do we go from there? And um, yeah, so. And what do you make, since we're on the Carmelites, what do you make of Teresa of Avila and her? Because her suffering, I mean, yeah, like she was persecuted by the Carmelite order, but her suffering more had to do with sickness and scrupulosity. So like, what do you make of her accounts of suffering? Her accounts of suffering. I mean, I've, I've read, I've only, you know, beyond like online things I've read interior castle and, um, uh, for, but I, I think her and John of the cross would, would be together on this of like suffering. The Carmelite way is like purification period. Mm -hmm. And, um, any sufferings that come your way, it helps you really get a sense of for who you are, because the, the big thing for them is the total dependence on God, yeah, utter dependence on God, and um, stripping away of sensory experiences, turning away from the world, into your, turning directly into your soul, because God is dwelling within your soul, and um, fully relying through the darkness of faith of being in that in that space and in that prayer. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't happen overnight. Well, you know. God's that's that's an infused grace so God can give that to who, who God chooses but at the same time you know there are certain steps to get up to that and so the suffering that comes that's the asceticism is one part of that part of the spiritual life and Carmelite spirituality I mean that that's what it is mm -hmm. um is really embracing the cross really loving the cross and um you know I I once read I, I don't know if you're familiar with him David Fleming he's a Jesuit um spiritual writer he's he died several years ago, but he was he was really big about promoting the spiritual exercises and whatnot. But he made the comment that um, you know, Ignatian spirituality and Carmelite spirituality, uh, they do not work together. You cannot, you know, be 
be living out of both spiritualities at the same time. I remember reading that. I'm like, you know what? I, I find that questionable. But the more I read, I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. You know, could you be, you know, living out of the spiritual exercises, praying with the Ignatian spiritual exercises, and then be a full, fully into the dark night of the soul, following after John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila? Um, I don't think you'd be doing them at the same time. My theory. Just saying. I mean, my general belief is that everybody is called through a particular charism and like part of your relationship with god is predicated on being faithful to that charism that was chosen for you but i think that doesn't mean we should be like closed in on that particular charism we should we should be able to draw insights from all of them and recognize that there is overlap because at least for Teresa, she said her best spiritual directors were jesuits she had a good a few good dominicans but um you know, I definitely think she borrowed a lot from Ignatius and from, you know, the Jesuit order. But yeah, I think at the end of the day, like, it's hard to commit yourself to two different paths or to give your life completely, you know, mm -hmm. I think you know, there's a point there, but yeah, um, well, uh, yeah, to your point about, uh, well, I've, I have an aunt who's actually a Discalus Carmelite, she lives in Lake Elmo. And um, I would, I would write her, we, we write letters, but she, she does, they don't have a computer. And she handwrites, but she gets permission to use a typewriter if, if she wants to. But um, we we write back and forth. But she's always had Jesuit spiritual directors, and because yeah. um, she's always told me that the Jesuits in spiritual direction they're very precise and to the point and very pragmatic. And um, now I, I use that word very 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 loosely. Pragmatic. I've I have issues with it, but yeah, um, you know, Jesuits are very practical in in that regard. But um. Yeah, as far as uh, mixing Carmelites, and she's done the spiritual exercises too, but she would change some of the um, imagery in the spiritual exercises. And so uh, there's one, ex and especially in the second week, and um, uh, for your listeners, uh, if you're interested in the spiritual exercises, don't read them, just go pray. They're not supposed to be read. Yes. They're kind of boring if you read them. But um, she was praying with it, and the, there's an image of, you know, Ignatius, he loves war imagery, and, um, you, know, you know, putting yourself in place of following Christ the King. To, to to do battle against um you know to wage war for souls and um but but for for my my aunt sister Teresa she used the image of um um of a field hospital you know and working for souls in that regard not really following a king and um but like as healing souls and that's an image that Pope Francis uses quite a bit as yeah. well but like so that I think they'll they'll do some adaptations within within uh, prayer practices the Carmelites do with the spiritual exercises. Yeah, and I think that's definitely, there's definitely something about the precision in the like discernment process with Ignatian spirituality that a Carmelite could benefit from. Because if you look at Teresa, like she, and I mean, I don't want to be too anachronistic, but she was kind of neurotic. She was a little bit all over the place because, and at least in her childhood, like one minute, she's very obsessed with her clothes, with social status, with going to all the parties, finding like a really glamorous boyfriend. And then she wants to run off to get her head chopped off by the Moors and become a martyr. So like she's constantly oscillating between these extremes. And then you see it when she enters the convent that like she has these very intense moments of intimacy with Christ. And then there are these other moments where she's like, I'm a horrible worm. I'm so sinful and disgusting. Um, how can you bear with me? I'm terrible. But I think like yeah, like I just think of Carmelites as oscillating between these extremes, this like very um, intense passions. And you see how like, at least in the moment of the ecstasy, her awareness of her brokenness, her suffering, her the darkness she goes through, this is the moment when she has this intense spousal erotic experience with Christ that she like, tot he totally penetrates her soul. And like she, when she describes the ecstasy, she says, you know, like, it's really painful. Like, it really feels like an arrow is entering into my heart and piercing not just my soul but my body but it's also intensely pleasurable and it, it's ecstatic you know so i think yeah like the jesuit spiritual directors can definitely help ground someone who goes back and forth between these extremes um but just so speaking of ignatius i'm i want to hear more about like because i i've never done the exercises i never prayed or read them but I don't know, like how, how did Ignatius face suffering? Because his suffering was kind of different from John and Teresa. Yeah, I mean, he, 
Well, he was in a, he, a lot of parallels with um, Teresa of Avila because he, before his conversion, he was kind of a vain, vain guy, uh, very proud and um, wanted to live a life at court. But um, he, uh, early, he was born in 1491. I think in 1521, he was fighting against the French at Pamplona and a cannibal came and hit his leg and um, he had to surrender. And when he was, he had a, a conversion moment when he was um, getting better at the Loyola, at, back home with his family at Loyola in Spain. And um, so he, his leg was pretty messed up. And so he had a limp for the rest of his life. And um, also too, and he, he took on a lot of ascetic practices when he was after, so he, he got better from Loyola at, he was reading, you know, lives of the saints and he read about life of Christ and that completely changed him. He's no more vainglorious for, you know, things of the world he want to be vainglorious for, for Christ. And so he took on, uh, you know, all these different practices, a lot of fasting, walking barefoot, um, praying for hours, hour, hour, hours at a time and um, begging alms and doing all the, a lot of charitable work for people. And, um, but so much so that it, it kind of ruined his health as well. And, and that's why, especially in our constitutions and a lot of our documents, you know, Ignatius is very careful about fasting and doing penance. He, yeah. he's a, he gives, um, you know, well, well, especially now, like we always have to have a lot of transparency. Whenever I'm in retreat, full transparency with the, with the director of if I'm going to take on any fasting or any sort of penances, because um, just got to be very careful about ruining one's health. And so for Ignatius, that became kind of the guiding light for it. And um, so taking on asceticism, you know, where the Carmelites, they, they taught, take on many ascetical practices, um, especially in, in, within poverty. But for us, you know, we do the asceticism for the mission. And uh, so we're, we're active, you know, so someone coined the term, uh, active um, contemplatives in action. And um, I think it was Jerome Nadal, one of, one of the earlier Jesuits. And um, so that kind of informs everything that we do, especially in regard to asceticism and, and suffering is we do it for, for the mission. And that means detachment from, and this is in the first principle foundation of the exercises. What's the point of, you know, life, you know, praise, reverence and serve God. And then all creation is for that. end. so detachment from, you know, riches or, or poverty, health or sickness uh, and those kinds of things. So detachment from those things in order to really serve the greater good. What is the greater good that God is calling me to? Yeah, and I think that's important because it's very easy for penance to become masochistic, self-indulgent in a way. But oh, yeah, sure. when you're saying that like you have to be in a dialogue with your spiritual director, it kind of gives it this objectivity that like, okay, you're doing this to further the mission. You're doing this for a specific goal. So if it starts to just become this, you know, this selfish kind of endeavor, then that's when you lose the whole point of it, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think, but also what you're saying about the active contemplatives, like I definitely think of Jesuits, I don't know, like Ignatius was a warrior. There is this kind of warrior mentality that obviously isn't violent in you know the literal sense, but there is this sense of a battle, this sense of winning over, you know, souls for Christ. Whereas I think the Carmelites, there is this more um, no, there's this like the focus on the intimacy between the individual soul and Christ, this more, I don't know, not that Carmelites aren't, you know, don't have a, a missionary dimension, but you definitely see there's more of this personal level of their charism, you know? Right. Well, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because, you know, the patron saints or the missions are mm -hmm. Francis Xavier, you know, one of the greatest missionaries of all time after, you know, St. Paul, uh, you know, Xavier went to India, one of the first Jesuits, one of the first Europeans to go there, India, um, all over Indonesia and to Japan, and he died off the coast of China. And um, but also uh, Teresa de Sioux, yep. she is, she's the patron patroness for the missions as well. And um, so I think there's something to that, even though they're living like con a contemplative life mm -hmm. and within community though too. So there's a communal aspect to it. And um, but as far as you know, doing prayer, fasting, penance for souls, that's very serious for the Carmelites as well. They do that for for the sake of the church. Yeah, and you see there's something very counterintuitive about their missionary work because they're saving souls from within the convent, not going outside. And yet you saw how, you know, she was really inspired by Francis Saver and like kind of had this jealousy in a sense, like she wishes she could go out saving souls. But if you look at um, the correspondence between her and Father Maurice, who I don't know, I don't know what order he belonged to, but he was a missionary in Africa. 
So like they had this written correspondence where she kind of fulfilled this desire to be a missionary through him. And he was inspired by her contemplative life and the intimacy she had spiritually. So it's like, I don't know, we can have all these different sensibilities. And even if we're called to a particular lifestyle or charism, like it's not that we lose, we don't lose any of those gifts that we have, like they're fulfilled in a new way, in a way we don't expect, basically. Yeah. And I, I think the key is like listening because the vocation is a calling, you know, and um, to, re to really listen to where God is calling, you know, me, you. And uh, I, I think that's key because I, I, I see some people, you know, seem to think like religious life. It's like, well, what's, where can I find my most self, you know, actualized self or self fulfillment? And I, I want to say like, well, you got, you got to turn it around and be like asking God, God, where do you want me? And, that, and that's the key yeah. to finding what your charism is, what, what charisms you have. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with that being said, I do want to go back to Benedict and this kind of postmodern sensibility. But before we do that, I want to hear from you, like, how do you think that the, the mystical tradition and this, you know, this understanding of being suspended in the abyss, being, you know, in this void, what does it have to say to what you see going on in the culture today, like the trends and the kind of tendencies that you see happening now? Trends and the tendencies, I, <laughs> I, I would need to give it a lot more thought. I just think, you know, people are looking for meaning, you know, and I've, I'm sure you've had a lot of guests come on here and say that, but it, it is, and I'm not the first one to say that. I, I feel like I'm kind of not original at all, but like we're, people are always looking for something better and uh, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's with, uh, you know, Tinder, with Hinge, with uh, anything and everything, people are always waiting, like, is this it? No, I want something more. There has to be something better on the horizon. And um, yeah, and there's, so there's an insatiability that we're trying to fill, but we can't figure out how to fill it. And um, so I, 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 I see that and just lack of, yeah, centeredness, lack of peace, lack of stability. I feel like everyone's unhinged and always giving their, you know, um, most unfiltered thoughts online. Of course, you know, the technology itself has kind of created a own vortex unto itself as well as how we communicate to each other. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's just we're crisis of meaning. That's what I see in postmodern world. Of course, that's very postmodern because there, there is no meaning, you know, create your own meaning or try at least or die trying. Be cringe. No, yeah. be based or die cringe. <laughs> Pretty much that's that, those are our only options so no there's definitely yeah i would i would characterize it as a restlessness like i don't think we're content with this conclusion that there's no meaning and that we we either have to make our own meaning or distract ourselves um but i don't know like i see we're all suffering but we're very afraid to look at the suffering for what it is and delve into it and ask like, okay, what does this mean? Like, is it possible that there's a meaning in this, in my personal abyss? And I think what we do is we seek distractions, whether it be, you know, something productive like work, making money, um, whether it be like pleasure or something instinctive, drugs, substances. For some, I think for a lot of people, we looked for distraction in like some kind of social cause, like finding a way to locate the source of my suffering in some kind of social issue and then create a uh, you know some kind of project to fix it which is again like there's something noble about it but to just sit with the suffering and be like okay i'm suffering it hurts i'm sad what does this mean i think it's becoming increasingly difficult to to do that because if the underlying assumption of the culture is that well there is no meaning there is nothing within the suffering then we have to do something to escape. We have to turn to either, again, some kind of distraction, some kind of social cause. Um, and yet this is why we're restless because as much as, again, there might be something good about distracting yourself sometimes or trying to change social structures, like that is not gonna fully heal the brokenness, the pain, you know? No, um, I, I think you know. if, and I mean, if we look at the last 60, 70 years, of like social change in the United States, there have been social changes. But at the same time, like, um, well, I think all the social justice warriors that I don't know within, you know, the Catholic Church, and like, there's just a lot of resentment. A lot, mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, why isn't why aren't things changing as fast as we want them to do? 
or this and that. And I, I think with any social change, like there's always going to be a little bit of anger, you know, and wanting more from that as well. But it's also, I mean, it's interesting considering that the Jesuits have a reputation for being very involved in, you know, the social mission of the church. So like, I don't know, for you, how do you balance the understanding that no, like no social change is totally going to resolve that restlessness with the fact that no, we do also have a calling to respond to, you know, so sins that manifest on the social and structural level. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, well, I mean, that goes back to the beginning with Jesus, you know, building the kingdom, kingdom of God. And, you know, how do we create no well, help form a society where human dignity and the human person is flourishing? I think that that's a very Christian thing. And um, as far as like undoing structures of sin, I mean, that, that's very serious. You know, here in the United States, there's, there's a lot, lot to do. And but I think going back to Ratzinger, his big thing was, what, what's the mission of the church? And I think, again, you probably mentioned this, like the church, sometimes we, we think of the church as like a political tool. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think it becomes very, very dangerous, whereas we're slowly on the plane of politics, but there's more the spirituality, worshiping God, praising God. And um, so Ratzinger, he says the church does three things. It cares for the poor, uh, it worships God, and it evangelizes. And um, to, to keep all those things in mind, work that's the work of the church, not to um yeah those things have to be together in our work and what we do because ultimately if we're just another organ for social change then like who needs the church you can just turn to an ngo or a nonprofit or a political party um Mm -hmm. you know if jesus is just a social justice activist then like i mean who cares there are plenty of others you know like i think the unique insight of the church is that real change begins from this this discovery that there is a promise of hope, no matter how bad, whatever your situation is. And um, yeah, that like experiencing this hope, experiencing a conversion, forgiveness for your sins, the wrong that you've done in the world, that like that becomes an impetus. Like that's your starting point of getting involved in society. It's not, we have to change social issues so then people's lives will be easier or better. No, like life is made better by this encounter, by this experience of hope. And then we can go, carrying that hope into the social realm that's a different that's a very different approach to social issues from like we must change this because we are suffering and we need to fix our suffering because even under the most ideal social circumstances we will suffer we will will suffer because of our sins because of you know things are not always going to work out our way no matter how ideal the society is there has to be that foundational level you know definitely that that personal individual foundational level of almost sounds like you're describing conversion, Stephen, you yep, know, and um, I mean, that's, that, I, I do think that's, that's very, very crucial. And because especially when disappointments do come, um, and they will, yeah, and, and they will suffering is in this life. Again, we live after original sin. A lot of people claim they don't believe in original sin. I believe in it more and more every day, <laughs> you know, but um, no, that, and that's the thing of like, really, because what do we believe in? Not the social change itself, but like God is at work in the world. And we believe that God is with us here in this suffering. Jesus came and suffered with us. And that's the image ultimately in the first chapter of introduction to Christianity, that like we are in this abyss, we are in the darkness. And it's not that God magically takes us out. It's that he enters into it. They're like, And this is ultimately the cross that God enters into human suffering and becomes one with us in that suffering, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is, and now just to, again, go to more, the more contemporary implications of Ratzinger Benedict. What I really love is that he's saying, yeah, like, let's not take any of this for granted. Like, let's really call everything into question and be like, yeah, I mean, what do we really believe? Is there really a God? And if so, does God enter into this suffering? Um, so it's, it's humbling because he's saying we need to enter into the position of the non-believer. We can't claim to be on some other level and this is why i think like as much as benedict when he became pope developed this kind of controversial image in the mainstream media like he was i mean at least before the council he was considered one of the progressive theologians not in the sense that he was heretical but like the fact that again like he wanted to call things into question he wanted to be in dialogue with non-believers that he taught he took these you know philosophers like nietzsche very seriously And like, I love that he talks about Holy Saturday because I feel like this day gets overlooked because people put so much emphasis on Good Friday 
and on Easter. But what Benedict is saying, or that's her saying about Holy Saturday is like, this is the day that God is dead. Like Nietzsche was really hitting on something here because we all experience this moment in our lives. We experience this sense that like, you know, there is not some, there isn't some kind of ultimate hope or fulfillment. We do feel very alone. And it's in, during Holy Saturday that we can really say, yes, like I feel that, but we still have the hope that Easter is coming. But he doesn't brush over. He doesn't say, just say like, oh yes, the resurrection makes everything better. No, we do have to go through Friday, Saturday to get to Sunday. And like, in that sense, like takes people like Nietzsche very seriously, which as much as Nietzsche did not have a full grasp on the truth, like there's so much there that we have to look at, right? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, well, so you're sitting in the darkness and that that is faith right there because faith is, you know, believing in testimony. You're something you don't verify yourself. And I think, I mean, I, we all have so many beliefs and to claim that modern people were, were very informed on things. I don't think we are. I think we have a lot of beliefs that we, we tend not to really be critical of, but especially like religious faith. Um, mm -hmm. Sitting in that darkness, going through Holy Saturday, and again, I come to the question of like, what, what do you do when you do, when you lose that, when you're in the darkness and you can't see where you're going, but you got to cling to something. And I think for a Christian, you cling the faith that the resurrection will come and just passing through that and just pray with that. And there's, there's a lot of fruit that really does come through that. Cause at the end of the day, like resurrect, resurrection is coming. I've had so many, I mean, I, I feel like there's like the daily moments of that sitting through Holy Saturday. And then there's the big you know, human being destiny of like, where am I going, yeah. going through Holy Saturday, but uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, like, you know, having faith, believing in Jesus, passing through all those different Holy Saturdays for me, like, I feel like my faith has just been strengthened more and more. Mm -hmm. So, and that being said, I, I think like the fact that he's taking people like Nietzsche seriously, like, I don't think we see how much people like Nietzsche, these philosophers who called into question the certainties of modernism, of the enlightenment, like really have had such a huge influence on our culture. So I don't know, like what, what are some of the things you see in Nietzsche? Like how do you think he's, his thoughts have shaped the way we think today or the cultural stuff today? The thing, well, I think, you know, I've heard some people say Nietzsche was a nihilist. I think he was afraid of nihilism. He was like the Jeremiah, you know, in the Old Testament, who didn't want to preach what he had to preach, but he's there. And Nietzsche is like, we got to worry about, you know, if we find no values in anything. And um, of course, he saw it late 19th century of, you know, God is dead, the lessening of Christianity and, and um, that, that cultural power. And so we have to form new values. And uh, do we have to form new values? No, but I think he was hitting it on the head of like, if we have lose a sense of values, where are we going to go? Well, you know, okay, it's not going to be good. A lot of nihilism. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, yes, there's a miscalculation there that we can make our own values because at the end of the day, we're still limited. We're finite. But I don't know, like what attracts me so much to Nietzsche is that he's willing to call into a question these kind of flimsy certainties of the Enlightenment, which I don't know, I would just, I would say they're really naive. Like it's this blind trust in human reason and human calculations, which as much as yes, we do have the gift of reason, we are still kind of stuck because of original sin. There's still stuff that we can't access. There's still this, not everything is like sunshine and rainbows and flowery, like humanity can be very violent and messy. And we make a lot of I don't know, like, there's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of problems within the human condition. And I like that he's not afraid to face it and say, yeah, no, like we can't pretend like everything's good if we just, you know, use our reason. Um, and I think like this is, I don't know, a lot of philosophers will, you know, call this into question. But I do think he's opened the door for a lot of the postmodern theories that we have today that shape so much oh, yeah. of the culture, like, you know, for better or for worse like he's he's unlocked a door which i think is crucial um and I, I wanted to read this is a quote that i reference a lot so this is wayne c booth who's like a literary critic but he says postmodernist theories of the social self have not explicitly acknowledged the religious implications of what they are about but if you read them closely you'll see that more and more often more and more of them are talking about the human mystery in terms that resemble those of the subtlest traditional theologies. 
So I think, again, like once you clear out these false certainties of the enlightenment and recognize like there is this darkness, there is this mystery, again, you can turn to total nihilism, total relativism, which a lot of the post-structuralists have done, but you can also turn back to the mystical tradition You can turn to the abyss and say, is God present here? Is there this mysterious being in the midst of it all? Um, so again, like you have to take Nietzsche with a, a grain of salt, but the fact that he's opened up this honesty, this, this rawness again, I think is crucial. And Benedict understands that. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think, yeah, Nietzsche opening the door. I mean, I feel like the philosopher king right now is Foucault, you know? Mm. And um, I, I think what's, what's beneficial is looking at power dynamics mm -hmm. and like, where is the power in society? And I think, I think that's very, very crucial to understand who's making decisions, who's controlling what, because that, that really, you can be able to see like who's manipulating, who's controlling, who's hiding the truth. And again, you know, the mo modernity, um, it's okay, we claim to be, you know, believe in free freedom and equality and fraternity, but at the end of the day, like, you know, they kind of rip that mask off and be like, do we really, do we really believe in all of that? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> freedom what and equality was bad. Yeah. What do you think Nietzsche would say to Foucault? Like, because I mean, sure, Foucault identifies as a Nietzschean, but they're saying two very different things. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think Nietzsche would just be horrified that we're all even still studying him right now. Yeah, um, it's, it's about time. I, I know. <laughs> I I need to read more more Foucault. I've only read like you know the the Stanford encyclopedia thing on Foucault. I I need to dig more into him. Yeah, I mean, only do it if. Uh... I don't know. It's a headache. I don't know if it's worth it. I I enjoyed my favorite one was Madness and Civilization because I think there's a lot of value there, but still it's it's a pain to read because it's so like elaborate and esoteric. You never really know what he's what he's trying to say. Yeah. I mean what I what I what my one interest in him is that I think in his history of sexuality, he comments on the desert fathers and the monks. Yes. And their asceticism. So I, I'd be very interested in reading that. I'm sure I will probably disagree with a lot of his takes, but I'm sure it'll be revealing. Yeah. And he talks a lot about confession and how like certain discourses were developed off of the, you know, I guess the the manuals for confessors. So mm. Yeah, I think, again, a lot of his conclusions are super questionable, but the questions that Foucault is asking, I mean, I think we have to look at them, Definitely. especially the church has to look at them because he has a point, but yeah, otherwise, so no, I mean, beyond Benedict's postmodern sensibility, theologically, philosophically, I think personality-wise, there's a lot there that, again, like kind of gets masked over by the labels that the mainstream media ascribes to him, but like he has a very unconventional personality. Um, and it was, I think it was the the last testament, the interview that he did, the book interview he did with Peter Sievold. He talks about how he was a fan of Pope John the 23rd because he was so unconventional, because he, you know, like he was very himself, like very outside the box. And I think the fact that Benedict, like he can be very blunt, like he doesn't really. I don't know. I, I might dare to say that like he has this kind of taste for being provocative and saying things that he knows is going to get people riled up. Not for the sake of anything like, you know, anything uh, selfish, but like, I think he just likes to say the truth for what it is without trying to sugarcoat it or package it nicely. Um, and I, I don't know, like there's this, there is a little bit of a snarkiness. There's something iconoclastic there that I think is I don't know, it's unique and it's it's fun. It's entertaining. It's better than just like, uh, you know, trying to appeal to the masses. And he definitely did not. Well, I mean, I don't know. I felt like, especially here in the U.S., like the media, he did not have the most charitable coverage. I feel like no, absolutely not. yeah, absolutely not. But um, yeah, at the same time, if you took time to read what he he was actually saying, um. You know, he had a lot of good things. And I feel like his just big thing was like, you know, the faith in the West. What is going on with the faith in the West and secular secularization? I mean, that was his real, real concern. And um, yeah, just trying to be a little provocative here and there and bring, bring attention. Yeah, and he, he had a way of being very witty. Like he was very 
artful about the way that he got certain things across. And this is this is where I, you know, risk going into a little bit of controversial territory. But I do think as much as again, people will write him off as like as a bigot or being backward, there is a lot of overlap with what some will call the camp sensibility. Um, and I say this because there's an essay. So when the um, when the Metropolitan Museum did the camp exhibit, they had they put out like a book of essays or commentary on the aesthetic tradition of camp. And one of them says, you know, camp is like emerging in so many different ways in the culture today. And he says, you know, let, let me read, what did he say? Um, so he mentions the Supreme Pontiff, totally de mode, so alien to popular experience in the limelight as to retire from the throne, an impenetrable garbo-like indifference. Therefore, graciously considering his successors, successors efforts from a distance, so viciously elegant, so unrelentingly medieval. Um, yes, I mean, <laughs> Benedict has a flair for paradox, for drama, for being over the top at times. Also has like a real artistic cultural sensibility, loves pageantry. You can see that in the vestments that he wore, but also like he's a huge fan of classical music, would always invite composers to come to the Papal Palace to perform. Oh yeah, um, he, he was loves a Mozart. Yes. He plays Mozart himself. Uh, yes, he does. He does. Um, he's a connoisseur of beer, also rumored that he smoked Marlboro Reds. So he's a very, you know, vivacious guy. But again, like I, I, what I love is this paradox within his aesthetic, artistic sensibility. Like he's not, as the media paints him to be, this kind of like, you know, the Rottweiler, God's Rottweiler. Like he's not this God. kind of, you That's know, right. bland guy who's just mean and harsh. Like, there's something behind it all that's actually very intriguing. Yeah, he, he needs a new publicity campaign because there, there's a famous picture, might be on online, of him sitting on a couch in a tie with Carl Rahner and I forget, it was, there was someone else there, maybe Hans Kuhn. And like, it's very German because like there's cigarettes, they're like smoking cigarettes and they're like beers and whatnot. But like, you know, that, that's who he was. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely think mainstream media outlets had we're trying to paint a certain picture, but if you look yourself at him, like the guy is fascinating. There's much more to him than just these, uh, you know, these doctrinaire statements. And even in those statements, again, it's not just being doctrinaire. There's like a real insight into the human condition, into the culture that's worth taking seriously, whether you're a person of faith or not, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other, so other than Pope Benedict, I did want to ask you um, first, Oh, this is what I was going to ask. Silence. The book and the movie. The book and the movie. This was not part of the. the no, script. it's not. This is <laughs> off, You're going off script. Off cut. Off cut. <laughs> um, can I get a hot Jesuit <laughs> take on silence, whether the book or the movie? Because I, I just. Have a text, but not a Jesuit one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed the book. I really did enjoy the book. And I enjoyed the movie too. And. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the ending of the movie, I, I find it a little questionable. Just with, and Bishop Barron, I mean, he gives a phenomenal review of, of the movie. Um, a lot, I don't know if, can we do spoilers on this? Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, well, you know, the, the, the main character, Andrew Garfield, the Jesuit character, he dies and um, in Japan and he threw away the faith. And, um, but he, he's in, they're, they're burying him in, in like this what casket basket thing and uh, he he has his hands the, 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 this is how the movie ends like the movie pans into the basket as it's on fire he's, he's dead this is his funeral and then it shows a little little cross in his hand mm -hmm. kind of signifying that he never he, he never gave up his faith in, in jesus and uh even though he he recanted and he married and was living a very very uh, japanese life at that time in what the 16th 17th century and um I guess just for me, it's, you know, religion, like how do you publicly or privately live your religion? And it, I feel like it's kind of a modern take of, you know, privately living one's religion. And uh, if it comes in contact with the greater society, it's better to do it in private. That was kind of the sense I got. And mm -hmm. I feel like, well, Christians were called to be very public, especially if we look at the early Christians, like what the Romans did to the Christians, like they were martyred in mass. Yeah. And um there's something to that of publicly witnessing to to Jesus Christ, and I think there's a way to do it. Not not in a not in a um, ideological 
you know, political sense. I feel like there's a lot of that in the United States all over the place, but to really witness of like Jesus Christ has transformed my life. Mm-hmm. And I believe he can transform, you know, yours, yours as well. So that evangelization piece. Mm, that's a hot enough take. I will take it. <laughs> no. But I mean, it's worth pointing out that that end scene with the cross in his hand, that was not in the book. That was that's right. It was not in the book. And I think first, like when people are critiquing silence, they need to look at the fact that the book and movie are not the same, that Scorsese was trying to, he was trying to project something of his own spiritual journey because he does, he's always had a fascination with betrayal. He's always really looked closely at Judas type figures. But also, um, I think this was William T. Cavanaugh who wrote this in Common Wheel, but like ultimately Shusaku Endo was not writing a work of theology. It's Mm -hmm. literature, it's art. And you can't take the theological implications of it too seriously because that's not what it's going for, you know, but- No, it's true, it's a story. Yeah, and I I mean, I think like theologically the most interesting part is Kichijiro because as much as he denies the faith and sins, he has a real conviction about the fact that God's mercy is actually infinite. So no matter how many times he sins, like, we we start thinking he's the Judas figure, but actually he's Peter because he comes back and asks for forgiveness. And I think that's, if anything, the most valuable takeaway from the book or the movie. Personally, oh, yeah. I, th- I think in the movie he was probably my he was the most, you know, um, awful character in the movie. But I I think he was my favorite. Yeah, he's relatable. It's a safe. <laughs> I feel I saw myself in him. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, another Jesuit hot take on silence is Andrew Garfield had a really shocking experience with Father Martin doing the spiritual exercises. Mm. Yeah, because I remember America put out this interview with him and it was, I mean, it was really shocking that he, you know, like he says, you know, I'm typical kind of non-believing millennial secular, but through the work with Father Martin, really started to have this like intimacy with Jesus and saw like his love is very concretely real. So I I don't know, like I was just really shocked to see his work on the movie gave fruit to that kind of experience through the exercises. Oh yeah, definitely. Jim, Jim has a gift for like really reaching people through that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now his spiritual writings really go deep. So Mm -hmm. yeah, but one more question off the cuff again. So get ready. Um, Francis, the Pope, what do you think people, or like, what do you think the media misses about Francis that we should be paying attention to? Like, what's important about his papacy that's not on people's radar right now? Well, I think we got to remember, like, he's... He's not an American. He's he's from South America. He's from Argentina. Mm -hmm. And so any sort of media maneuvering for him to support, you know, any any number of issues here in the United States, I think we got to be very careful because he's not speaking. He's speaking to a worldwide church. He's speaking Mm -hmm. to the world. And some people, I feel like we really interpret like he's speaking directly to, uh, you know, like the United States church or this church or whatever. But just to keep in mind of like, yeah, the what what is he speaking broad more broadly to? Um, I, I I really do think that's crucial. And at the end of the day, too, of like his his real message is mercy, mercy and being out with people. And um, I think I think he's he's really harsh towards priests and religious. And I definitely think we we do we do need that reminder of we have to be out with the people, the smell of the sheep. That's that's crucial. Because it's really easy for a father to be held up in, you know, his his high tower um, community, his high tower parish, and you know th- this goes for all religious and diocesan priests. And it's because it's really easy to live a comfortable life as religious. It is very easy to do that. And but you know we're not, we're not called to live for comfort. Again, the Benedict quote. You know, we're really called to follow after Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So getting our hands dirty and really. Really having that culture of encounter, as he says, Mm -hmm. I think, because again, like that's where a real change, whether it's spiritual, social, political change begins in that context of like a real relationship. And that's what I get, at least I think that's what's most essential from his papacy. So Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So um, before we head out, anything you want to plug? Anything I want to plug? Well, um, order signing up for the seminary. Yes, if you're interested in the society, you can go to the Jesuits.org the website. So if you're discerning, please please go there. And um, you know, I write music on the side too. Mm -hmm. So if you look up uh, Eric Serrano, A R I C S E R R A N O S J, you'll find me on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, yes. all of, all the different sources. So and I'm I'm hoping to put out some more music in the fall. I, it's like electronic dance music, sometimes lo fi's whatever I feel. It's very haphazard, but mm -hmm. you know, it's what I do in my free time. It keeps me off the streets. <laughs> right. well that being said eric thank you for joining us and uh i hope everyone enjoyed yeah thanks for having me all right